So hi everyone, my name is Roderick and I'm a member of the Angular core team. Um, and then I actually wanted to start the presentation with something a bit special, to try to wake you up a bit. So I wanted to show you, uh, well actually when, I, when Carmen invited me to this talk, she told me don't hesitate to do crazy stuff. So one thing I wanted to show you is one of my hobbies, which is uh, being a magician. So I'm not, I'm not a professional, but uh, it's still pretty entertaining, especially since we say that Angular is a superhero. Uh, it's, it's relevant, right? So I broke this. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll try another one. Hold on. I have a, a deck of cards with me. So, sir, do you mind just telling me stop whenever you'd like? Stop. All right. So let's look at the card. So your card is a nine of spades. So this is interesting because if you look at the angular.io website and look at the doc type, you'll find that your card is right there. <laughs> so that brings me to my topic, which is Angular 2. Um, so if, if you haven't heard about Angular 2, it's the next version uh, of uh, Angular. And its website is angular.io. So we changed from angular.js to uh, angularjs.org to angular.io. Um, so this is where you'll find other resources, resources for Angular 2. All right. Uh, so currently, Angular 2 is in developer preview. So I want to preview it, preview it to you developers. And for that, I have the, a demo. So it's an application that's written in Angular 2. So what the application does is we just have the neighborhoods in Amsterdam. And you can remo report the amount of tourists on a trip that you see in a given neighborhood, and it propagates to the other browser. So uh, if you're wondering what I mean by tourists on a trip, it doesn't have to necessarily be a good trip. It could be a bad trip, since we're in Amsterdam. Um, so this, uh, this application has a couple of components of uh, interesting stuff in it, like we're, we have, we're managing a collection. Uh, we have components in it. We have integration with forms, sockets. Um, so for this presentation, I say, Let's build it. Let's build it together. So it won't be live coding. It will be recorded live coding. So I hopefully <laughs> I can't mess up so it's rec because it's recorded. Um, so we'll first start by building it in Angular 2 and TypeScript, which is uh, the language that Angular 2 is written in. And we'll talk about that a bit more. And then for learning purposes, we're going to convert it to ECMAScript 5. So still Angular 2, but in ECMAScript 5. So you can see the difference. And then we'll go a bit more crazy and convert it to <laughs> Angular 1 uh, during this talk. So if, if you're wondering what TypeScript is, it's just a superset of ES6, which is the next version of JavaScript. And it just has types and annotation added to it. Um, honestly, we could do a whole talk on ES6. It's very exciting. But uh, this is the AngularJS track. And if we did that, so many people would start dancing <coughs> off excitement, uh, which is great, except I'll be included. So that's not good for the talk. Um, and also, if you think that ECMAScript 6 is something in the future that is not here yet, well, my friends, we are getting to that future. If you look at the browser support, uh, Firefox already has 66% of the ES6 uh, features, Chrome 45%, and the Edge version of IE, which will come in Windows 10, also has 63% uh, behind some flags. All right, so let's start uh, with uh, building our app, the, the same app that I just demoed. So first, we need the, the code base of Angular 2. And to find that, we can go on code.angularjs.org. You'll we'll find all the builds of Angular 2. Um, so, and we'd want the 2.0.0 alpha. So if you click on that, we'll see that we'll be in a, in a folder that has all the builds. We'll be using the dev one uh, that will give us better error messages. Uh, and that will be written in ECMAScript 6 modules. And when we're going to convert it to ECMAScript 5, we're going to use the SFX version that puts things in the global scope. All right, so let's start coding. First, um, all right, so we will we'll have our script tag that includes Angular 2. And um, since I said we're in ECMAScript 6 modules, we're going to have to include System.js, which is a library that loads all types of modules, so CommonJS, AMD, and so on, including ECMAScript 6. So we'll be using that. 
Uh, and since this is an actual demo, and I don't want to hide the, the ugly parts, we also have a dependency on, tracer, on the tracer runtime, because part of the uh, Angular 2 code base is still compiled with tracer. It's not all converted to TypeScript yet. So, but that will be removed in the near future. And Right? And since we want, we want this to look good, we'll actually also include Bootstrap uh, with a theme for it to look like a Google Material Design. Uh, so uh, after that, we also need Socket.io uh, because we'll be using Sockets, and Socket.io is kind of the best solution. And now when it comes to TypeScript, we also uh, need to include the definition files of our vendor libraries. Uh, so since we're including just the JS build, which is the result of the TypeScript compilation, uh, we, we, and we want TypeScript to do type checking. So we'll include the definition files, which just tells uh, the TypeScript compiler that this class has these properties and so on. Uh, so what this will make is a folder called typings, where you'll find all the typings and a file uh, that references all of them. So in our app, we'll just reference this file, and then the compiler knows how to do its type checking uh, and so on. And uh, last thing for TypeScript is we also need to give some parameters. Yeah? We've got some, per some configuration for our uh, TypeScript compiler, uh, just telling it to uh, compile to ES5, for example, instead of ES6. And we can start developing our first Angular component. So uh, a component is just a class, an ECMAScript 6 class. Uh, we'll be calling it Tour Stripping App. It will reference that definition file that we mentioned. So after that, we can uh, import things from the Angular 2 module, uh, like component and the view annotation, and also a bootstrap function to bootstrap our app. Um, we're going to have to annotate our class to tell Angular that this is a component, and we'll, tell it, we'll give it a selector, so a CSS selector, uh, that when Angular will find an element that matches that selector, it will instantiate this component. And also, we tell, this, we tell it that this component has a view with a template URL, so that template will be injected in the DOM whenever Angular will find this component in the HTML. Uh, so, so now in our index.html, we can uh, reference our, our component and import our module, because we're in ECMAScript 6, we'll be using system.js. And finally, before we can actually open it in our browser, we'll uh, bootstrap the component using the bootstrap function, giving it just the component uh, function, well, class. Uh, run our TypeScript compiler using much mode so it keeps compiling. Run our HTTP server, and then we can open our browser and see it working. So we have it on port 8080. So we got the basic Angular 2 set up with the TypeScript compiler. So now we can start developing our app. Uh, so just final thing, the TypeScript compiler will uh, output a JS file, uh, but obviously we'll be working with the TypeScript file. Uh, it, you see it, it's right next to the, to, the, to the TypeScript file. In the configuration, you can change it to another directory. But for this, we'll just keep it simple like that. Um, so now starting to think about our app, we, we like actually engineering our app, we have this model called neighborhood. Uh, and and uh, this model will have a name and the uh, tripping tourist amount, like the amount of tourists that are tripping in that neighborhood. Um, and to manage that model, we'll have a service that we'll call neighborhood handler because we're great with names. And um, so these uh, are just ec uh, ECMAScript 6 classes. So I have a service folder with a neighborhood handler folder and my hidden neighborhood model. So it's, again, it's just a class that we're exporting that has two properties, which are the title and the amount. And also, we'll just have a constructor that takes these two parameters and put them on the class. So notice that everything here related to typing is TypeScript specific, but the class, the constructor, the default parameter all are ECMAScript, are all ECMAScript 6. Um, so that's pretty neat. We'll also have a method set tt amount uh, just as a helper that parse floats the value uh, in case it was given as a string. So we're, we know we're always working with numbers. Uh, thinking about this right now, we could have had a setter property instead of a method. Um, I guess I'm peer reviewing myself right here. Um, but for now, that, that will do. And then for our service, it's also just a class that will import the neighborhood uh, model using ECMAScript 6 modules. 
And since our, our service is basically managing a collection of neighborhoods, it will have a neighborhood array on it. Um, so the collection is just an array. And now in our component, we can import our neighborhood handler and start using it. So we need to tell Angular, to make Angular 2 aware of the service. So for that, we use the app injector, uh, which, so that uh, actual dependency injection could happen in our constructor. So now this service will be created in the context of this component. And we want our component to have a reference to this collection of neighborhoods, so we'll just assign it uh, uh, from the service. So now we can go to our HTML file, uh, change the template from works to an actual nice header, um, and start iterating over the neighborhood collection that's in our, on our component using ng4. Uh, similar to ngrepeat, just a slightly different syntax. And also we'll want to output our neighborhood name and amount just for testing purposes for now. And since we also need to make Angular aware that we're going to use this ng4 uh, directive, so you'll notice that in, in, in Angular 2, there's no global registry of things like services and, directive, uh, and directives. You need to tell Angular explicitly uh, that you're going to use these directives and services. And it's a bit more declarative and helps with big applications. So now before we can open this in our browser, uh, we'll notice that our collection of neighborhood is actually empty. So let's fill it up. And to do that, I'm going to use a similar design to uh, the array.push method that's built in in JavaScript. So if you look at the syntax, uh, push actually can take multiple elements, and they'll all be appended to the array. Uh, some people don't know this. So like if you have multiple elements, you don't have to call push multiple times. You can call it once with multiple arguments. Uh, so we'll so do something similar in our app. So on our service, we'll have a method called push neighborhood that takes the names of the neighborhood, and that will create the neighborhood object. So notice that here, every neighborhood name is a different argument to the function. So just to show off ECMAScript 6 features, when we implement this in our service, we can use REST parameters. So if you're not familiar with what REST parameters are, imagine you have a function that takes a parameter A, B, and then a REST parameter. That parameter will collect all the arguments given to the function that weren't, in the, that weren't defined. So in our case, we just have one REST parameter, and it, so it will take all the arguments and put them in an array. And then we'll map that to our neighborhood object using fat arrow functions, uh, which return the last statement that was in the function, and also they uh, persist the, this from the outside context. And then to push it to our array, we'll actually use push with the spread operator. So what the spread operator does is it, given an array that's passed to a function, it will actually expand it so that it becomes multiple arguments to that function. So here, it's as if we're passing multiple arguments to the push function. And we're doing that instead of concatenating, because concatenating constructs a new array, and we don't want that. We just want to modify our existing array. So that's some pretty neat ECMAScript 6 features. So now if we go on our browser and refresh, we can see that we can see the names and the amount. At least I can see them. I don't know if you can. Uh, so uh, yeah, again, looking at this code, I don't know if like, this is the next version of JavaScript, you know, imports, classes. Um, typing is TypeScript, but constructor and so much neat features, in my opinion. So now let's get back to thinking about our app. So we want to report the amount of people in uh, each neighborhood. So we're going to create a component called people count. So that it will look a bit like this. And how we want to invoke it is using an element called people count with a title and an amount. So um, let's start creating our component. Well, f first we'll call it in our uh, app template. So we'll have the title and the amount, and they'll be equivalent to the neighborhood name. Uh, and the amount will be the TT amount in the neighborhood. Since we want, this, we want there to be a binding between this expression and the property on the component, we'll actually have to put it in bracket notation. So what this means, that this tells Angular that the, the value is an Angular expression that should be evaluated and binded to the component. Uh, so otherwise, it's, it's just a HTML attribute. So then we can have our... Uh, our component, uh, which has two properties, title and amount. And it can, uh, we'll have to import the component and the view to specify it to Angular that this is a component and what its view is. So the component will have a selector called people count. Uh, the view will have a template um, 
that is just adjacent to the component. Let's fast forward. So next one, you actually need to tell Angular that this component takes two properties, which are title and amount. Uh, so then Angular will do the binding between the HTML and the property on this class. And looking at this, there might be confusion with title. Maybe some people will think it's a native HTML attribute. So let's just prefix it with the vendor prefix, and we'll call it TT. So here we're saying to setting Angular that we want title to be called title on the component, but we want a TT title in the HTML. So now there's no confusion that this goes to the people count component. So then we can go in our HTML, start echoing these two properties. And I just wanted to stop to let you know that in Angular 2, uh, if you do mistakes in expressions, you'll actually get an error. It will, f it will throw an error, while in Angular 1 it was forgiving. And if you did a typo, it would just output undefined. Uh, in Angular 2, it's a lot more robust, if you will. So let's just output title, amount, and an input range just for aesthetics. So now we can open our browser and refresh. And it doesn't output the people counts. And that's because we didn't tell Angular 2 that our app component will use the people count component. So just like ng4, we'll put it in our, the directives in, of our view. And finally, we can refresh and see that it is actually working. Uh, but there's no binding yet to the form. So next thing we're going to have to do is integrate with the input range. And in Angular 2, forms are a lot more um, robust because you have to define them in your component before you can use them in your template. Well, in Angular 1, you use just ng model and it just bind it to anything you want. Uh, in Angular 2, you actually need to define the form <coughs> elements. Um, and what we call them are actually controls. Um, and uh, so you have to instantiate them in your component. And they can't live alone. They actually need to be in a control group. You can think of a control group just like a form. It's just that it's built with nesting in mind. So you can nest control groups, have validation for all of them. And to, to construct our control group, we're going to need a form builder so that we'll just use dependency injection to have it. And we'll create a, group, a control group with a control called, called amount. And then we uh, have to tell Angular that we want that to, to instantiate this form builder in the context of this component. And we can go to our uh, HTML and bind our forms to the control group that we created, as well as the control uh, object for the input. And finally, we need to tell Angular that we're going to use these new directives, these new directives in our people count component. So form directives is just a collection of all the directives related to uh, forms. So we just import it and tell Angular that we're going to use it. Oh, also, since now you realize that our amount property is not connected to our amount control in any way, we actually need to listen, uh, tell Angular to tell us when the amount property changes from the outside world uh, so that we can update our control. And we'll use that, we'll do that using the on change lifecycle. So there's on init, on change, on destroy. Um, in our case, we're just using on change, and whenever the amount property change, we're updating our control. Again, that's for when the outside world changes it. Then we can go in a browser and refresh and see that the binding actually happens. Changing the input does change the value of the amount control. So that's great. Um, so if, if you've watched any of our talks on Angular 2, you'll find that we are talking, we ha in Angular 2, there's one-way data binding. So what that means is that in, while in Angular 1, if you had a component, which is a directive, and you, you had, for example, an isolated scope, you'd usually have a two-way data binding with the equal sign in, this, in the scope property. And that would mean that whenever the, it changes from the outside, it will propagate to the directive. But whenever it changes in the directive, it will also propagate to the outside. And that's makes it that in huge apps, it's a lot harder to reason about who's doing the change and when. So in Angular 2, we opted more for one-way data binding. So the, fr the parent could tell the child, could bind something to the child, but it's not the other way around. If, if something needs to propagate from down to up, it needs to happen via an event. So to demonstrate this, well, to demonstrate what I mean, I'm just going to output the neighborhood amount uh, and show you that in the browser, if we update it, you'll see that it doesn't update, uh, the model view doesn't update, it's just the value of the, in the component that updates, so it's not propagating. So again, to do that, to propagate, we're going to have an event that we'll call tt amount change event, and notice that we're using parentheses for the attribute here to say that this is an event. And for now, all it will do is update the model directly. 
To implement this event, we'll actually need to tell Angular that we have this event. Again, it's a lot more declarative. Uh, this event is just an event emitter that we're going to import from the Angular 2 module and instantiate it. And then in our, to actually uh, uh, fire an event on this uh, event emitter, we'll say that on click of this button, we'll call a method that report amount that we'll implement right now. Uh, notice again that we're using parentheses for click, so this will tell Angular to just do the add event listener on the button element. Um, so then we can implement our method. And all our method will do is create an event object and fire the event emitter. Uh, the event emitter has similar interface to iterators, so dot next with an event object, and the expression in the HTML will get invoked. So now we can open our browser, refresh, and see that it is actually propagating. Um, so it's propagating to our model from our component. That's pretty awesome. Um, so again, all we, so if you look at this, uh, these annotations, you can see that they are a lot more explicit. They're a lot more declarative. So uh, that, that's something new in Angular 2. Well, in Angular 1, you had to look at a directive's code, code to realize what it's doing. Uh, here, we can use this to generate API docs. Uh, this is helping IDEs help you. Uh, you c it also allows Angular to optimize your code, and if another human reads this, he can di they can directly realize that uh, this component has these properties, these events, uh, and so on. So next thing in our app for it to get to where our demo was, uh, was is implementing the thing that will take care of our socket, and we'll call it a socket handler because we're great with names. And uh, so again, this is just a service that is a class that we're exporting. And it has a property called socket that will respect an interface that's defined in our typings, in our definition files. So this socket will just be a socket.io socket that is connected to uh, port 9898 that I have running in the background. And this service will have two methods. The first one is update neighborhood that will actually ch take a change from the application and propagate it to other, um, to, to other uh, apps, to, uh, to other people running the app. And to do that, we'll use a data structure where the name of the neighborhood is the key and the value is the amount. So notice that, notice that here I'm using dynamically computed property names uh, in object literals. If you're unsure what that is, when you'll we'll switch to ECMAster 5, uh, you'll see the equivalent. And also, we'll have a method to, so that when other people update it for our app, uh, we'll have a listener uh, that another service will provide and that listener will be called with the neighborhood name and the amount. So the data structure is similar to the one above. So we're going to iterate over the keys, which are the name of the neighborhoods, and call the listener. Um, yep. So then in our neighborhood handler, we can inject the socket handler so that we can, uh, uh, for example, listen for when there's changes to update the uh, uh, neighborhood models. So just inject it. And usually, this is enough for the injection to happen. Uh, but with the current TypeScript, com TypeScript version of the current version of the TypeScript compiler that I'm using, uh, we also have to add a small annotation. So this won't be necessary in the next version of TypeScript, in the next release. Uh, so we'll just annotate uh, f uh, this uh, parameter to say that we want to inject the socket handler. Um, and this is just between services, not from service to component. So then we can use our socket handler and listen to when there's a change that happens. And when there's a change that happened, we want to filter through the collection of neighborhoods that we have. We're going to filter via name. Uh, so using the filter method on an array. Now here, I see that TypeScript is telling me there's an error with neighborhood. And when we look into it, we can see that there's a type mismatch that filter returns an array while we're expecting a neighborhood object. So this is a, a, a place where type checking is useful. So we just take the first result of the filtered array, make sure that it exists, and update the model. So uh, now going back to data propagation, if you remember uh, in our event on our people count component, we were directly updating the neighborhood uh, like with the setter uh, function. But that's not great, because now if you want to tell our socket handler to, prop to send that data to other uh, people opening the app, the neighborhood, ha the neighborhood model needs to tell that to the socket, and that's not good design. So instead, what we're going to do is make that this event uh, tells the app component about the change that will tell the neighborhood handler about the change, and then that will update the model and the socket handler. So again, it's all about data propagation and who's owning the data. 
so here we'll just update um, the event expression to call an update neighborhood function. And all that this function will do on our component is call the neighborhood handler um, and notify it about the change. So we'll need a reference to our neighborhood, hand neighborhood handler. Um, that will just call the update neighborhood on, uh, function on it that we're going to implement just right now. So what it will do is first tell the socket about the change so that then it could send an event telling other sockets about it. And then it will also update the, the model. So now if we open our, uh, in our browser, uh, you're right, we didn't tell Angular about the socket handler service, so we're going to do that by importing it in our uh, component app. And well, f we can put it in the app injector, just like neighborhood handler, but uh, conceptually the socket handler is not on the component level, it's on the bootstrap level, because we just want one socket handler per page. So we'll just put it as a second array for the bootstrap function. And then again, we can refresh and open another window, opening the same app, and you can see that the data gets propagated between the two. So we, we got to our initial demo that we, we showed in the presentation. And also, if you want it to be real-time, we just have to listen to the input event uh, on the input, uh, which is in HTML5, and you can see that it propagates real-time to the other browser. So yeah, that's pretty neat. Now let's convert this to ECMAster 5. So how many of you think this will be hard? Just one? OK. It's, so it's going to be easy. And you're, you're right, actually. We'll just have to change our TypeScript files to JS first, change the class to a function, and put our methods on the prototype. So if you weren't sure what prototypes were before, I think now you see the equivalent if you come from a world where there's classes. Uh, we're going to also have to remove any typing information. And for the default parameter, we're just going to use the OR operator, which isn't 100% equivalent, but it does a job. And then uh, we'll go to our socket, change it from TS to JS, change the class to a function, and put the methods on the prototype. Remove any typing information. And now we also have fat arrow. F oh, we have, we have the, the uh, dynamically computed um, property name. So if you're wondering what that, that was in ECMAScript 6, that's the equivalent in ECMAScript 5. And it just looks better in ECMAScript 6. So, uh, and then there's the uh, fat arrow function that will convert them to long form functions. So a lot more characters. So we already converted two of our files. Let's convert our neighborhood handler. So there's no imports in ECMAScript 5. Uh, you just have to include the, 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 the files yourself or use something like require.js. So we'll change the function to a class, uh, remove any typing information. Um, then here we have this annotation that is inject. So if you're wondering what's the equivalent in ECMAScript 5, well, it's a parameter. Uh, it's a property called parameters on the function that will contain um, the parameter, the, the injection information. Then we can add the methods to our prototype. Here we, we continue changing our arrow functions to actual long form functions. Um, and here we have, we're using this.neighborhood, but in ECMAster 5, uh, you lose this when you create a new function, but in arrow functions, that's not the case. So the usual trick is to do var that equal this. Uh, Angular, uh, yeah. So um, and then we'll continue changing long form function to a normal function and add a return statement because you don't need that in arrow functions, but you do in long form functions. Uh, but now noticing, you don't, we don't have to use var that equal this. We can actually just uh, reference the neighborhood collection and use it like that, which looks a bit better. Now, if you're wondering about the equivalent of uh, spread up of the rest, up, rest uh, parameter, uh, we can use the array.prototype.slice.call hack to get all the arguments as an array. And then to, we can change the arrow function. And to have the spread operator that we're using on push, we can use dot apply instead. So again, this is, these are a lot of syntactic sugar that exists in ECMAScript 6. And remove typing information, and we're done with our neighborhood handler. There's still the two components left. The first one is people count. Um, so let's remove, uh, let's change it from TS to JS. 
and remove and change the class to a function, remove the typing information, uh, add the methods to the prototype. remove the, uh, the imports, and now the annotations are a property called annotations on the function, and they, they become under the, uh, the Angular namespace or the Angular object, and we have annotation app appended to them. And we, everything that we were importing from the Angular 2 module is now under the Angular object. And for dependency injection for our constructor, uh, again, we'll use the parameters uh, that will tell Angular what to inject in the constructor. And I believe we're done here. Yep. So then we can go to our app component, change it from TS to JS, remove imports, change the class to a function, change this to prototype, uh, and then we have the annotations just like before, change it to the annotation property. Um, and add the uh, information for dependency injection. And we're done converting our, our, all our TypeScript to ECMAScript 5. We just have, to, ooh, except for the bootstrap file, for, for the bootstrap function in, in, uh, Angular, in ES5, we actually need to listen to when the DOM gets loaded. That's not the case in uh, ES6 because we're loading it via uh, system.js, which will take care of that, but that's not the case in ES5. So we'll go to our index, change the Angular version to the SFX, so that puts everything on the global scope instead of things to import from the module. We we'll also have to append our script tags uh, because we're not using any file loader uh, and remove system.import. So now we can open it in our browser and see that it is working. Woo. Right? So now let's do something even crazier and let's convert this to Angular 1. Uh, so first things first, we're going to change our Angular version to 1.4. <coughs> so 1.4.1 just got released two days ago, but I didn't re-record everything in a day. Uh, we also need to change, since uh, our app file is going to uh, define our module, we'll just put it on top. Uh, so it will just define it with angular.module, which doesn't exist in Angular 2. Uh, but in Angular 1, we'll have our own module system. So our component is just a directive, with its name being the selector but camel cased. And it also has a restrict to being used only as elements. And it also has a template URL, which is the same as our view annotation. So we'll also have a link function um, that will link, in our case, the neighborhood handler uh, collection, for example, to uh, the scope. So that's all the information on, on, uh, that we can capture that were in our annotations. Um, so again, in Angular 1, it, like directives and services are in a global registry. Uh, which isn't the case in Angular 2. So things like the app injector and the directives array, we can't put that. Uh, there's no equivalent in Angular 1. So, so then there's this function that used to be on our component that we're going to put on our scope for convenience. And yeah, we got rid of that. Uh, those two, there's still the push neighborhood, which we could put on our directive, but I feel sh it should be in a run block. You might disagree. We can argue about that in person. We'll just indict the service. And lastly, in this file, there's a bootstrap, which in Angular 1 is different. So we actually give it the module name. Um, yeah, that's it for this file. We're going to go to our neighborhood handler, which is easier to convert to Angular 1. We'll have our module, and it's, it's a service, obviously, with the neighborhood handler function. The only other difference here is that we are using the neighborhood uh, model, which we don't want it to be global, so we'll inject it in our service. Um, reference it right there. And let's put this in an immediately invoking function expression so we don't pollute the global scope. In, in, in TypeScript, that's not the case because every, the things you define in a module don't go to the global scope. So we're done with the neighborhood handler. The socket handler is actually even easier. It's also a service that uh, we register with Angular 1, and we're done here. We can go to our model. Um, oh, just indentation. Go to our model. Uh, this could be a factory that returns the model. So very simple. Ooh, let's wrap it 
and uh, EIF. Is that how you pronounce it? Anyway. Uh, and well, this doesn't have to be a factor. We can actually change it to a value. Um, it's not common, but it still works. And finally, we, yeah, we're done with our service folder. We just have our people count. So that's, again, an Angular module with a directive that's, in this case, called people count that's restricted, restricted to an element and has the same template URL as a view annotation. And let's, let's have it have an isolated scope because that's fairly easy to do. So notice that here in Angular 1, we don't have the choice but to use two-way data binding unless we want to set it up ourselves. Uh, so that would mean that uh, if when like amount changes in the directive, it will propagate to the parent. But we don't want that because then it, as the app grows, it's harder to know what's changing, who's changing what. Uh, so we're going to stick to our event and use this best practice. So we'll have our link function. Um, and actually, we're done with all the information that is in the annotations, except for the lifecycle, which isn't, there is no equivalent in Angular 1. So we have to mentally compute that the equivalent is actually to watch the amount property and update the control. Uh, so let's keep that in mind and remove our annotations for now. So in Angular 1, there's no uh, equivalent to controls. You're, it's all a free-for-all. So for, for our case, we'll just put it as a primitive. Um, and again, the lifecycle will watch instead, which doesn't exist in Angular 2. And we'll watch the amount property and update our control. Um, because otherwise, if we were relying on our amount uh, property, we'd be updating the parent uh, data, which isn't something we want. So lastly, we'll put our remote amount, uh, report amount method. Ooh, sorry. Yeah, we'll put our remote report amount method, and uh, the event syntax is slightly different. It's not an iterator. It's just a function that you call. And we're done with this. So we, we just converted all our JavaScript from Angular 2 to Angular 1. The only thing that's left is our HTML. So in Angular 1, there's no ng4 model. Instead of ng control, it's ng model. And also, there's no generic click event. You actually, actually need to use a wrapper, in this case, ng click. And in our uh, app template, there's no ng4. It's ng repeat with a slightly different syntax. And also, there's no brackets to say that there's a binding. Uh, so we have to remove that. And as you can see, we're actually losing information with Angular 1 uh, because now, looking at this, it's not obvious what's a binding, what's an event. And you actually have to go to the directive code to understand it. So finally here, uh, yeah, that's it. We can go to our browser and refresh and see that it is working, except that there's a problem with the sync between the component amount and the, uh, the model amount. And that's because when we're changing it, we're getting an event from the socket. And in Angular 1, we have to tell Angular uh, to do like scope.apply to tell it to do the dirty checking. That doesn't exist in Angular 2 because we use zone.js, so that happens automatically for you. Uh, but for Angular 1, uh, our socket handler needs to uh, tell Angular to get back in the Angular context, if you will. So let's inject our root scope because it's a service. Um, and do scope.apply, the famous scope.apply. And so now it should be working. So we just had our app in Angular 2 uh, and TypeScript. Then we converted it to ECMAster 5. Then we converted it to Angular 1. Um, and I guess you, you saw the difference. Um, so we're done coding, finally. So what, what did we learn with all of this? Well, first, that in Angular 2, we use ECMAScript 6 modules. We don't have our own model, module system. Uh, so we integrate very well with the, with the language. And finally, the language gives us this stuff instead of having to rely on RequireJS or, or Browsify. Uh, so again, we're using ECMAScript 6 and TypeScript. And if you're worried about the additions of TypeScripts like types and annotations, uh, there are already a, a pro proposals for ECMAScript 7 uh, to have these features. Uh, so it's definitely on the way. And also in Angular 2, uh, we have this, this idea of components that allow for a lot more isolation. So you can, you can simulate it in Angular 1 like we did, but you can also not simulate it, and then you, it's hard to maintain along the road. Um, so also, it's a lot more declarative. So in Angular 1, there's no information in the template, for example, about the bindings and the events. In Angular 2, uh, there is. And finally, if I, uh, a tip. 
if you're, so for now, if you want to implement something, you should implement it in Angular 1 if you're building a production app. Um, but if you want to build it in a way that, that will be also easily converted to Angular 2, I suggest you look into the controller as syntax, um, which uh, allows, allows you to uh, take your controller and expose it to your scope. So, you so in Angular 2, we didn't mention the scope at all. That was just behind the scenes. In Angular 1, you do, unless you use the controller as syntax. Um, also, that prevents stuff like uh, you get the dot notation, which is a best practice in Angular 1, uh, just by using controller as. So before parting, uh, before leaving, I just want to give you some resources for Angular 2, if you want to explore some more. Uh, we, there's some pr pretty good blog uh, posts on Victor's uh, blog, which he's a part of the Angular team. Uh, also, Ionic has a little series introduction to Angular 2. Thoughtgram, which pa Pascal is one of the people behind, uh, also has information. I have blog posts on it. Uh, also, I find this uh, uh, blog, uh, this post from Angular Tips on why Angular 2 rocks, and it also goes into a lot more details. Uh, and finally. I feel I should mention the Angular slash Angular repository, which is where Angular 2 is being developed. Um, so um, I, I feel it's underrated to tell people to just go to a repository and read the test and read the code base, because that's how you learn uh, a lot about the framework. Uh, also, if you have any issues, you can open it there. Um, finally, if you uh, want to see the app, you want to download it, run it, uh, and so on, and see. So I have the different versions in different branches, so it's on uh, under my personal GitHub uh, username, so I already had that slash uh, tourists on a trip. And yeah, if you want to evaluate this doc, uh, we're told you can do it on a mobile app. And we're done. <laughs> so I, I tried to go through this fast to have time for questions. So does anybody have any questions about Angular 2, even Angular 1? Uh, anything, actually? Yes? Uh, well, I, I don't know if you need a mic. I don't know. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the talk, uh, I want to ask about dependency detection. Yep. Uh, is uh, using annotations the only way to define how uh, the services get injected? <coughs> so you need to make Angular aware of your service somehow. Yes. Uh, so you can, you can do that in the app injector or in the bootstrap function. Um, but then to inject it in your function, in your constructor, yes, you have to use annotations with the parameters. But I'm not surprised if people do helper methods, helper functions like libraries that help you do that. Um, also, the next talk is about dependency injection, so maybe they have more uh, information on it. But honestly, like you were, you were doing something similar with uh, Angular 1, so you were, e it, you were either, either letting it parse your function or maybe putting it in an array. So it's not all that different. Yeah, well, my question is, uh, are there ways to extract this uh, whole definition to a different file for that? So, so in Angular 2, the, the thing is, uh, it, it works a lot more on types. So as long as you have a handle on, for example, a, the people count component, yes, you can have in another file defined that the people count needs this, uh, uh, this stuff to be injected in it. Though I would say that's harder to maintain along the road because, I mean, whenever you want to change the dependencies, you also have to go in another file instead of having it be con consolidated in one file. Well, if you have a factoring tool, it's a little bit You can discuss that that tool. At the end of the day, it's JavaScript. It's very flexible, so you can do crazy stuff with it. Uh, so, yeah. uh, another question. Yeah, and uh, how do you make uh, external libraries, uh, how do you make ang like Angular dependency injection uh, container, probably that's what it's called, uh, aware of external libraries that uh, are not aware of Angular per se? Uh, so what's great with Angular 2 is it integrates very well with the language. Uh, so you just, when you inject something, you just give it r any random function. And uh, in this, by default, it will uh, uh, instantiate the function with new. But you can have your own recipes, so you can say that uh, this jQuery uh, function is actually nothing more than the value. So just like in Angular 1, we had dot value. In, with a new dependency injection system, you have things like bind jQuery to jQuery, and that would just uh, bind it as a value. And I think that in the next talk, you'll see more about this. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, so what are the annotations that are available apart from the components and view? Are there any other annotations? 
Okay. Any other annotations? Is the, in this language, the use script, the use, yes. Um, there's also a directive annotation. So while components are a component in, in an application, a directive is something that changes an existing element, like ng4 is a directive. Um, and also, anybody could create their own annotation. It's actually just a function that is put on, the f on another function. Uh, I'm not sure of any other annotation that we're using other than also inject uh, component view. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it, I believe. Any other questions? Yes? And so at the end of the talk, I mentioned that Tina Blue will start using it around May. Right. How is it coming out? Um, personally, I don't know. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm a contractor working remotely for the team. Uh, so I, I and actually with the time, those time zone difference, the team meetings are like at midnight, so I don't uh, participate in all of them. Um, but hmm, so it's in, it's in developer preview for a reason. And I'm not sure if inside Google somebody's already starting to use it, though I wouldn't be surprised if they did. Um, I know in Angular, in the team, we'd also, we've, did, we've done a hackathon where we just build apps with Angular 2 and just put our issues that we didn't like about the framework that we want to fix. Um, you, can, you can, well, Angular University is happening in a couple of days at San Francisco. You'll probably hear, hear some more news on Angular 2 then. So just keep an eye on Twitter or, yeah. Anything else? No? Yes. Yeah, maybe I'm not, not aware, but is there any uh, controls, like standard form controls, to be developed by Angular team? Like, you know, people use it all the time, like calendar or file call team. Sorry, I, I can yeah. repeat the question. Yeah, he's asking uh, if there are controls that are coming with Angular team, the, uh, the material for Angular. I think that's probably the closest, and the Angular yeah. two version is maybe up there now. Because more, mostly when I develop something, I need a like, file code and preview. Right. Uh, something that comes from Angular itself. Yeah, that's probably, uh, she, she's the one working on it. So, <laughs> well, she, yeah, she used to work on it. Uh, yeah, there's Angular material. Uh, I don't know of, of any other uh, uh, component libraries that are developed by the team. But I wouldn't be surprised with Angular 2 to have a whole ecosystem about it because it's, it's a lot more isolated. There's a lot more better standards, if you will. Uh, so, yeah. For Angular 1, I don't think there's any except, uh, Google, uh, except Angular Material. But that's it. Thank you. Thank you.